Oh, good. Good evening. My name is Alice Knapp. I'm president of the Ferguson Library, and this is um, one of our civility lectures. Um, we've been doing this since 2012, believe it or not, on civility, and asking experts in certain fields to come and talk about civility and how it relates to their field. We do this with the Dylan Schneider Group and Hearst Media. And I'm very happy tonight to introduce Elliot, Elliot Millionson because I just think this topic is so incredibly important. Um, this is the second time since I've been an adult that we've had a scourge that has across our whole entire nation and there's solutions out there for them. So let me just introduce him and then let, I'll let him talk about what he's done. Elliot Millington was founder and CEO of Direct Access Diagnostics, which developed the world's first home test for HIV. The company was acquired by Johnson & Johnson, and Mr. Millington was named president and CEO of the J&J &J subsidiary. He currently serves on the board of directors of Harm Reduction Therapeutics, a not-for-profit pharmaceutical company developing a version of the opioid antagonist naloxone to be sold over-the-counter at cost. He has served on the board of African Medical and Research Foundation, the largest health NGO in Africa, and has provided advice to the Chinese government on approaches to HIV prevention. Prior to J&J, &J, Mr. Millison worked in, at the investment firm Odyssey Partners, where he was Odyssey in-house marketing expert. He also served as president and CEO in the successful turnaround of Polynex Corporation, a company owned by Odyssey. Millison was a member of the initial three-person marketing team at MCI, where he had a new product development, developing innovative new services that helped MCI grow to its first year with $1 billion and annual revenues. He started his business career in brand management with Procter & Gamble. He earned his BA from Cornell and MBA from Harvard Business School. He financed his education at Harvard by consulting on marketing and strategy, including to the U.S. Office on Smoking and Health, where he helped develop smoking cessation strategy. He wrote at on Harvard Business School's case study focused on the challenges of government marketing. A native of Washington, D.C., he, grew, he currently lives in Potomac, Maryland. And let me introduce you. Hello. Um, I have some prepared remarks. I usually speak off of bullet points, but since the um, talk about the value of civility and AIDS goes back now, we're in our 39th year uh, in the fight against AIDS. Um, and I wanted to quote some things, and so I thought it better to have a prepared speech. But for, for some perspective on that, um, the Cold War began, most historians say, in 1945, some say 1948 with the Berlin blockade. So the Cold War was between 41 and 44 years, and we're now in our 39th year in the fight against AIDS. Um, and much of the progress we've made since the first cases of AIDS were identified in 1981 is directly attributable to a focus on civility. Um, and as most of you know, in the early 1980s, many people with AIDS were ostracized. They faced discrimination from employers, landlords, and insurers, strangers, friends, and family sometimes rejected them. Schools wouldn't sometimes admit AIDS patients, AIDS, people with AIDS through their doors, and even some hospitals refused to admit them. So a focus on civility proved an effective antidote to the fear and ignorance which initially caused people to shun their countrymen. And progress didn't just happen, government played a central role in that by educating people and by enacting laws and regulations to foster societal civility. Now in 1816, 40 years after the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson wrote to a friend, laws and institutions must go hand in hand with the progress of the human mind. So the AIDS epidemic has sh often shown government at its best, evolving to meet new challenges. It has also seen government at its worst, failing to confront the realities of human behavior. A CDC report was released just two weeks ago admitting progress in HIV prevention has stalled, and that underscores the consequence of government's failure to act wisely. But I truly believe a renewed focus on civility can put us on a glide path to winning the fight against AIDS. 
We all know that there are three branches of government, executive, judicial, and a bicameral legislature, which provide checks and balances on the behavior of people in government. And our freedoms of speech in the press, as well as regular elections, are additional checks on government. Yet government also provides a check and balance on our behavior through leadership and example, including instituting a framework of laws and regulations. Aristotle said democracy arises out of the notion that those who are equal in any respect are equal in all respects because all men are equally free. They claim to be absolutely equal. Our democracy has succeeded because its guidepost is not only equality but also representation. The faintest voice as well as the loudest can be heard. When government action is needed, it is the responsibility of our leaders to balance and harmonize those voices for the public good. Civility and democracy are therefore intertwined. In The Federalist, Alexander Hamilton wrote that government has been instituted because the passions of men will not conform to the dictates of reason and justice without restraint. One great error is we suppose mankind more honest than they are. Our prevailing passions are ambition and interest, and it will ever be the duty of a wise government to avail itself of those passions in order to make them subservient to the public good. Sadly, a failure of government wisdom has resulted in aids threatening our domestic tranquility for four decades now. For perspective, more Americans have died from AIDS, it's over 700,000 so far, than died in all battle deaths combined since the Revolutionary War. Over a million Americans are living with HIV, but one in seven aren't even aware of it. And there are still 40,000 new infections annually. And the cost not only in human lives of, of that is great, but we're accruing 15 to 20 billion in future healthcare expenses each year. The result is that we spend almost 1% of our federal budget on HIV and AIDS. Worldwide, 35 million people have died from AIDS, and one in every 200 people in the world is infected with HIV, a quarter of whom don't know it. And there are still 1.8 billion new infections annually, all from a virus that isn't airborne, but spread, spread primarily through sex. In the 1980s, as AIDS was beginning to ravage lives across our nation, I had the idea that a home HIV test could prevent the spread of infection. I formed a company to develop one with my now wife, Wendy, a physician with expertise in the technology for home testing. I was 29. We didn't build the company with deep financing, but it was built with a focus on research and science and the hope and dream that home testing could help stop the spread of AIDS and save lives. I was a business person, I, as you said in the introduction, so I told her, <laughs> approval is going to be easy. We'll get it 90 days after we file an application. What could possibly go wrong? Indeed, today, home testing is hailed by the World Health Organization and embraced by more than 50 nations around the world as a vital tool to fight against AIDS. But in 1987, when FDA received the first application for a home HIV test from the company I founded, it responded by refusing to consider such tests. Not understanding that political factors influenced FDA decision, other countries around the world followed suit and also banned home HIV testing. It took 25 years until 2012, as tens of millions of people around the world became infected, for FDA to finally lift its ban. Only then did other countries follow suit. I never expected home HIV testing would be so controversial, opposed around the world, or that it would take decades to get one approved. Larry Brilliant, who participated in World Health Organization's smallpox eradication program, observed the key to containing an epidemic can be summarized simply, early detection, early response. That's why in the midst of the 2014 Ebola outbreak in West Africa, WHO called for the development of a rapid Ebola test. The reason public health officials took so long to embrace home HIV testing is a lesson in the need for civility, especially in a crisis. Events are like footprints in the sand, easily washed away by the tides of time. But sometimes they're fossilized, 
And if we look at them closely, we can see the pathways of our past which link us to the present. There's a lot of books in this library that will help with that. So I'd like to take you back in time to the 1960s to help explain the role of civility in our nation's response to AIDS. The Civil Rights Movement and the Vietnam War Peace Movement were demonstrating the power of civil disobedience. And FDA's approval of the birth control pill was revolutionizing heterosexual relationships. The gay rights movement also began in the 60s with the 1969 demonstrations following a police raid at the Stonewall Inn, a gay bar in Greenwich Village. It's the 50th anniversary this year. As gay men began to come out of the shadows of their closeted lives, they began to mobilize politically to demand the equality and acceptance they deserved. Stonewall also ushered in a gay sexual revolution and a dramatic rise in clubs and bathhouses where gay men began to meet and enjoy social and sexual discovery. But incubating in this sexually active, politically engaged community was a deadly sexually transmitted infection silently taking hold. As AIDS began to manifest itself in the 1980s, many Americans reacted with dread and fear rather than empathy and concern for their sick and dying countrymen. This reaction understandably conjured fears in the gay community of even greater discrimination, marginalization, and threats to freedom. AIDS activism was born. Activists were predominantly young gay men, and they organized to fight for the development and speedy approval of AIDS treatments. They took to the streets to demand that a government perceived as hostile to their very existence help them survive. Identifying infected people is a staple of sexually transmitting disease prevention, but activists vehemently oppose testing, viewing it through the lens of their collective experience that it taught them to fear discovery, condemnation, and oppression. The first public discussion of testing came in a 1983 meeting CDC convened over concern that hemophiliacs were becoming infected with HIV from tainted blood. AIDS activists, FDA, and blood banks attended the meeting. A test for HIV hadn't been developed, but a CDC scientist, a guy named Don Francis, and you may have seen the movie and the band played on or read the book, and he is portrayed as a hero in that story. He was a CDC researcher who believed screening procedures he developed could help protect the blood supply by eliminating over 75% of infected donors. But as Randy Schultz wrote in his book in The Band Played On, activists firmly opposed taking any action to screen blood donors, saying the screening would pose serious civil rights concerns. Blood banks also opposed screening. They didn't want the cost, and they feared screening would frighten away donors. So facing opposition, Don's superiors at CDC abandoned plans to screen blood. More than a decade later, a report by the Institute of Medicine concluded that strong opposition from outside groups had a major impact on government's failure to initiate blood screening. Action, the report said, that would otherwise have made considerable sense, but there was little potential political reward and some political cost associated with taking a leadership position in AIDS prevention. The government's failure to lead wisely on prevention had tragic consequences. It took two more years until 1985 for FDA to approve the first laboratory test to detect HIV. By then, half of all hemophiliacs were infected. As blood banks finally started screening all donated blood for HIV, an unforeseen consequence happened. Many gay men who didn't know if they were infected began donating blood as a way to get HIV testing. Concerned about the potential impact on the blood supply, blood banks lobbied CDC to fund independent testing clinics where people could test for HIV instead of donating blood. In response, CDC funded state and local health departments as well as independent organizations to establish what were called alternate testing sites. Now, I stepped into the fight for HIV in 1986. It's a long time ago. The technology for a, a rapid home HIV test existed. My wife was an expert in rapid testing. But when I spoke with FDA about my plans to develop one, FDA said they wouldn't approve such a test 
regardless of accuracy. I was shocked at their rejection of an obvious important public health tool. I wasn't aware of the politics that AIDS activists opposed testing, fearing it could be used against them by employers, insurers, banks, landlords, the government, and even sex partners. They'd aggressively lobbied against HIV testing and had pushed to erect barriers to its use beyond screening blood. A key tactic was insisting anyone getting tested getting, get mandatory counseling. At some clinics, mandatory group counseling to see if people were emotionally prepared for test results. If not, they were counseled against getting tested. A 2016 study by Columbia University's Center for the History and Ethics of Public Health concluded, although some officials noted privately their suspicions that the new counseling emphasis represented a monkey wrench designed by gay activists to obstruct routine testing, the counseling and testing paradigm quickly became the cornerstone of HIV prevention efforts. The report went on to state, New York City's program is implemented, involved nothing short of urging at-risk persons to avoid the test and its potential to create worries that need not exist. Callers to the city's AIDS hotline were all but told that getting tested was a mistake. So counseling became an impediment to testing. One wonders if the government's laissez-faire approach to the aggressive discouragement of testing would have been the same if HIV had initially infected heterosexuals. In 1986, my wife and I didn't know there was opposition to testing and didn't yet understand the com complex nexus of political interests that govern AIDS policy. So we decided since FDA wasn't open to a rapid home test, we designed something new and different. It was a mail-in test. Using the kit, people drew a few drops of blood onto special paper, put it in a prepaid mailer, and sent it off to a lab where it was tested with the most advanced tests available. Results, counseling, and referrals to local care were available by phone using a unique code number, so it was completely anonymous and confidential. In 1987, we submitted an approval application to FDA with clinical trial data that results were as accurate as tests done by a doctor or hospital. We also submitted research on the effectiveness of telephone counseling and survey data revealing a third of Americans who wanted to get tested for HIV would only get tested using a home test. CDC did research which later confirmed the identical results. So a third of people who wanted to test would only test using a home test. So I was stunned when FDA responded to our application by instituting a ban on even considering applications for any home HIV test. At the time, AIDS was almost always fatal. During the median 10-year incubation period before AIDS symptoms appear, testing for HIV is the only way to detect infection. As I began to understand that FDA's ban was a response to political pressure, it was hard for me to believe activists could oppose testing until I came to understand their concerns. While many Americans felt great compassion for people with AIDS, there was also still significant discrimination and stigmatization. I had no doubt that home testing could save lives. I devoured medical research on AIDS and HIV testing. But as a Greek philosopher Heraclitus observed, much learning does not teach understanding. I didn't actually know anybody living with AIDS. I empathized with their plight, but didn't comprehend the deep distrust, despair, and sense of marginalization many activists felt which drove their intense opposition to HIV testing and motivated FDA's ban on home HIV tests. In the face of FDA's ban, my wife, Wendy, decided to move on. She still wanted to help in the AIDS epidemic and ended up working for FDA as Deputy Director of Policy in their AIDS Drugs Division, where she helped to develop the policies that speeded AIDS drug approvals. Despite FDA's ban, I felt a strong moral imperative to keep going. I thought that without the confidentiality and an anonymity of home testing, AIDS would continue to spread unchecked, stealing lives across America and the world. So I pushed on. I met with senior officials at FDA, but got nowhere. However, things changed after the Wall Street Journal published an op-ed I wrote. I used that to approach the Washington Post. 
As Louis Brandeis, Associate Supreme Court Justice observed, sunlight is the best disinfectant. I told the Post reporter that FDA's commissioner had promised me that FDA would hold hearings on home testing, but he'd so far refused to schedule them. When the Post contacted the FDA commissioner, he said, we're just about to schedule those hearings, and it resulted in an article. Federal health officials say they are reconsidering their strong opposition to AIDS antibody testing for use in the home, in part because many people who want to know whether they are infected are refusing to go to clinics to be tested. I contacted Nightline and Larry King, and soon other media were contacting me. The publicity seemed good. Nightline did man-on-the-street interviews, which confirmed a strong public desire for home HIV testing. People calling into Larry King loved the idea. But behind the scenes, opponents were busy. Activists began to lobby state legislatures in New York, Texas, California, and Florida, our nation's four largest states, to ban home HIV tests in case FDA ever approved one. Then a member of Congress scheduled a hearing in advance of FDA's hearing. At the congressional hearing, I was the sole advocate in a sea of opponents. The committee chairman warned against putting HIV testing in the hands of the greedy, unscrupulous, and irresponsible. I was the only one in favor, so I assume he was talking about me. FDA Commissioner Frank Young also testified. Three months earlier, FDA had published a pamphlet he'd written on home testing in general, titled A Doctor's Advice on Self-Care, in which he'd written that home tests held great promise for improving the public health and fit with our take charge attitude. Young extolled the benefits of using home tests even to help detect serious medical conditions, writing that home tests to detect hidden blood in the stool can help uncover colitis or colon cancer. Yet before Congress, FDA's commissioner testified with no support that people using a home HIV test might do themselves harm. Despite an HIV test being the only way to diagnose HIV infection, Young testified, we've gone a bit far in thinking that a mere test can diagnose a condition. FDA held its hearings on home testing the following month. I was drowned out by activists, representatives from state testing and clinical laboratory associations, CDC and FDA itself, all of whom spoke in hyperbole about the grave risks of home HIV testing. Wendy was still FDA's direct deputy director for AIDS drug policy and told me that around FDA, home HIV testing was now referred to as the Millinson problem a reference to the product FDA could have easily made go away, except for the one lone proponent who wouldn't disappear, me. Over the next year, I continued discussions with senior officials at FDA. It was clear their mind was closed. So in March 1990, I filed suit in U.S. District Court seeking to compel FDA to drop their ban. Within a week, FDA proposed settlement, agreeing to review the data on our home test at an FDA advisory committee meeting. I let the press know. The New York Times reported FDA had reconsidered its long-standing opposition to the idea of testing for AIDS in the home and would accept applications for approval of test kits. The Washington Post noted FDA had sent letters to 30 testing companies advising them of their new policy. I got busy to prepare data to present at the advisory committee meeting. But behind the scene, as often happens in Washington, Opponents got busy. FDA opened its July 1990 meeting on home HIV testing by announcing it hadn't lifted its ban and that the meeting was only being held because of a legal settlement. The testimony by the head of the Association of State and Territorial Public Health Laboratory Directors was typical. He testified our test would serve no public health interest and could lead to tragedies. During my testimony, FDA's advisory group chairman who headed a clinical laboratory, remarked that I'd done a marvelous job of making a very articulate presentation, but then called the idea of, of approving a home HIV test an exercise in absurdity. At the end of what one publication covering the meeting later called a contentious trashing by FDA, only one advisor had the courage to vote for approval. He commented, it was almost as if this matter was brought before FDA's subcommittee on non-approvability and observed, 
Home HIV testing to some degree is a substitute for other kinds of services. It did not occur to me that the agency was in the business of trying to protect existing suppliers from new products. That lone advisor was a hemophiliac and later died from AIDS. The truth is I no longer had the resources to continue the fight. I was broke, but not broken. Shortly after FDA's meeting, I went to a law library and figured out how to file a new legal action against FDA on my own. It took two years for FDA to respond. After seven months of discussions in February 1993, we reached a settlement. I dropped my suit and FDA agreed to expeditiously review my application. But their expeditious review would only begin after I ran new clinical trials and succeeded in getting New York, Texas, Florida, and California, the four states that had banned home HIV testing, to reverse their bans. At the same time I was talking with FDA, I'd initiated discussions with a large company who had expressed interest in the great public health potential of home HIV testing. So shortly after I settled with FDA, my company became a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson. And now a CEO of a newly formed J&J subsidiary, we ran clinical trials, which again demonstrated that our test was safe and effective. Most importantly, I began to reach out to opponents of home testing, leaders in the gay community, public health departments, and HIV testing clinics to understand their perspectives and the reasons behind their strenuous, seemingly unyielding opposition to home HIV testing. In 1787, Thomas Jefferson wrote, I hold it that a little rebellion now and then is a good thing and as necessary in the political world as storms in the physical. Activists were a tireless storm battering FDA. They knew about every ongoing drug trial and lobbied FDA for better, faster, and earlier ways to evaluate drug efficacy rather than just using death as an endpoint. As I reached out to activists, I developed genuine admiration for their courage. By standing up for themselves, they turned anger and frustration into a positive force. FDA became more humane in its approach to AIDS drug approval and ultimately changed its policies so that people with serious life-threatening conditions, not just AIDS, now have the choice of using unapproved drugs, not just drugs that have been approved by FDA. The result of activist pressure on FDA to approve AIDS drug, drug, AIDS, AIDS drug approvals was breathtaking. From 1987 to 2011, FDA approved 35 AIDS drugs. The longest time FDA took to approve from submission to application was just under 11 months, a process that is even today measured in years for non-AIDS drugs. I met with hundreds of activists. Some were skeptical a business person's interest in AIDS was about anything more than making a profit. But many people were willing to engage in conversation with an open mind. I spent thousands of hours getting to know people. There's great power in civility. We talk candidly and develop trust. Some of home testing's fiercest opponents became its strongest supporters, like Bruce Decker. Bruce had been an advanced man for President Ford and was managing a hotel when he learned he had AIDS. His focus quickly changed. He became chairman of California's first state AIDS advisory committee. It was Bruce Decker who introduced Elizabeth Taylor to Matilda Krim, and together they founded American Foundation for AIDS Research. Bruce was Facebook before there was Facebook. He introduced me to other activists and my friend network grew from there. I didn't just meet with people to talk about home testing. Over time, we worked, strategized, built consensus, and socialized together. I remember going with Bob Hattoy, who spoke very movingly at the 1988 Democratic Convention to the movie Philadelphia. The movie in 1993 about a lawyer who's fired after his firm finds out he has AIDS came 12 years into the AIDS epidemic, yet was one of Hollywood's first attempts to talk about the issue of AIDS and discrimination. Hattoy was an effervescent fountain of political insights, advice, and friendship. He was working in the Clinton administration when I met him but was incredibly frustrated with how slowly the government was moving on HIV prevention. The support I received from medical luminaries like former Surgeon General C. Everett Koop and Donald Francis, the CDC researcher and hero of In the Band Played On, were also very meaningful. When I first met Chick Koop, I told him I'd worked on the government's anti-smoking campaign, an interest he shared 
And he looked at me and he immediately said, you're in. And once we talked more, offered to support home testing. Don Francis had left CDC when I met him, but he reached out to his former colleagues on numerous occasions to urge them to be open to home testing. One weekend, I went down to Fort Lauderdale to an awards dinner honoring Don. Bruce Decker had also flown to the dinner. And Bruce Don, a local activist, and I took a motorboat out for an hour with Don driving. I can still remember how relaxing that time was, but I also vividly remember sitting next to Don at the awards dinner and saying, boy, looking at Bruce, he's so fit and strong. I can't believe he has AIDS. And Don, who had worked on the Ebola epidemic in Africa, he was an infectious disease physician, looked at me and said, just wait. After we met the heads of civil rights groups like NAACP and National Council of La Raza, which is the largest Latino advocacy group, as, as well as National Medical Association, the largest national organization representing African American physicians, and Inter-American College of Physicians and Surgeons, the nation's largest association of Hispanic physicians offered their support and let FDA know. Public Citizen, the advocacy group affiliated with Ralph Nader, which is often at odds with pharmaceutical companies, let FDA know, FDA know they supported home HIV testing. I'd reached out to members of Congress on both sides of the aisle before, before joining Johnson & Johnson. Connie Morella, a House member from Maryland whose district includes the FDA, as well as Arlen Specter, who was senator from Pennsylvania at the time, had both let FDA know of their interest in home HIV testing. Now I met with more members of Congress to hear their concerns and to let them know of our support from AIDS activists, prominent health officials, and major interest groups. I was able to marshal bipartisan support from dozens of members, from Newt Gingrich on the right to Barney Frank on the left. I couldn't get everybody's support, but I met with the heads of state health departments, and a few, including New York, New Jersey, and California, sent letters of support to FDA. But some state health departments and laboratory associations continued to see home testing as a threat. I also faced unyielding opposition from many HIV testing clinics that continue to express their virulent opposition to home testing. I'd like to share a story to provide some perspective on the difference between before I reached out and after. A little after six o'clock one evening, I received a call from J&J's corporate communications group to let me know that the Whitman Walker Clinic in Washington was holding a press conference the next morning to, quote, announce their strong opposition to J&J's home HIV test. The head of J&J's corporate communications group, who reported to the chairman of the company, wanted to meet with me the next morning to discuss how we should respond. Now, I'd reached out to Whitman Walker on several occasions, and they'd refused to meet, but I hadn't anticipated a press conference. The clinic had a high profile in Washington and over the years had testified against my test and opposed it in media interviews. In addition, despite my complaints to the commissioner, the FDA staff were reviewing our application, volunteered at, and was on the board of directors of the Whitman Walker Clinic. I didn't want to wait until after a potentially damaging press conference to respond. I wanted to make a showing at the press conference to minimize any damage. I decided to show the unequivocal support for our test among leading AIDS activists and respected health professionals. So working with Bruce Decker, I crafted a statement of support that made a strong case for approval. We then placed calls and faxed the statement to dozens of activists and health professionals across the country, asking them to sign on. We worked until after 3 a.m. on the East Coast, fortunately midnight on the West Coast where many of our supporters were, to pull things together. By the next morning, we had a statement of support with several pages of signatures and a short biography of each supporter. Two activists who lived in Washington handed out our statement of support at the press conference and were available for interviews. Another went inside to monitor the event, which was well attended by affiliates of the three major broadcast networks, as well as CNN, the Associated Press, and others. Our work muted the opposition. Now that I had supporters, I was no longer standing alone. We reached out to the press. As a result, editorial boards at papers including the Los Angeles Times, New York Daily News, and Chicago Sun-Times were calling on FDA to approve our test. Magazines like the New Republic and Forbes also wrote positively about home HIV testing. 
But I knew support from CDC was important. They funded many of the brick and mortar testing clinics around the country that saw home testing as a competitive threat. CDC had historically opposed home HIV testing and had consistently testified against it at public hearings. To try to overcome their resistance, I met with CDC Director David Satcher twice and we'd open up lines of communication between our two organizations. At one meeting with him, I was joined by Mario Cooper, who was head of AIDS Action Council, which is the most respected AIDS policy organization at the time, had once opposed home testing, but had since become a friend and a quietly effective supporter. Mario came to the CDC meeting to help me demonstrate activist support, and the result of all that effort was that CDC seemed supportive of our test. After we submitted an amended application to FDA with data from the new clinical trials they demanded, and I got the four states which had banned home HIV testing to agree to reverse their bans, in June 1994, FDA held an advisory committee meeting to reconsider home HIV testing. Over 60 of our supporters came to speak. Members of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus sent a letter of support to the committee. And even CDC came to the meeting and for the first time publicly supported home HIV testing. At the end of the meeting, advisors voted unanimously for support. It took 23 more months, but in May 1996, FDA finally approved our test. The science hadn't changed one bit in nine years since we'd first submitted our approval application. But through civility, the politics had. All of this happened decades ago in the early de decades of the AIDS epidemic. But it demonstrates how the power of civility, reaching out, listening, creating trust, and building co coalitions turned what was once near unanimous opposition to home HIV testing among AIDS activists, public health officials, and members of Congress into a consensus for support. When FDA approved my mail-in test, they kept their ban on rapid home HIV testing in place, tests that would allow people to get results within minutes like the one that I had initially proposed to FDA way back in 1986. It took until 2012 for FDA to reverse that ban and finally allow rapid home HIV tests. The rest of the world followed. Today, more than 50 countries have approved home HIV tests. Our best hope to end the spread of AIDS is to encourage sexual civility for people to test before having sex so they can get treatment if they're infected and not unknowingly spread infection. Just as government encouraged companies to develop AIDS drugs, it should encourage companies to innovate to develop better, more affordable, and more consumer-friendly home HIV tests, and then work with industry to launch a campaign to encourage their use at the point of sex, in the same way government advocated for condom use. In a letter to Thomas Jefferson in 1816, John Adams wrote, Power must never be trusted without a check. For four decades, Americans have trusted government to end the AIDS epidemic, trusting that our system of checks and balances would ensure that government put the public good above self-interest. Yet as half of all hemophiliacs became infected with HIV, CDC chose not to screen blood, not because of science, but because of politics. For 25 years, as almost 2 million Americans became infected with HIV, FDA banned even considering rapid home HIV tests, even though there was no scientific justification. Our system of checks and balances failed, and people died needlessly. If we hope to defeat AIDS, we must first defeat the institutional self-interest and political cowardice that has allowed this disease to wreak havoc across the American landscape for four decades. The structure and management of the various agencies that, that focus on AIDS should be rationalized and reorganized to encourage cooperation, and most of all, to for foster a shared mission of serving the public. I have no doubt that with the power of civility and the strength of our democracy, we can not only end the AIDS epidemic, but also meet all the difficult tasks that lie ahead. Any questions? No, thanks. Yeah. Well, yeah, the, the, um, the 
Johnson Johnson took the test off the market, um, unfortunately. Um, and so there is a company that has a test, but it's about $35. So what you want and what we need as a country is a home test like a home pregnancy test, which is what we proposed in 1986. It's a simple test. It's a rapid test that you fit in a pocket or purse. It's easy to use, consumer friendly, and you can get, you know, two for $8 or something, um, $5 on sale. And the technology is readily available for that. The cost of producing such a test is less than a dollar in the cost of goods, in the cost of the actual test. Um, so that's really what needs to be done. Um, sure. I think you appeal to the notion of understanding. Understanding the other side. But as you were, I'm going to focus just on the civility part. As you were going through this, what did you understand in terms of why were the, for instance, the AIDS activists opposed to it? Well, you know, I think the, you had tremendous fear of testing being used against them. So there was a fear insurers are going to use this against me. Employers are going to use this against me. Landlords are going to use it against me. Sex partners are going to use it against me. So there was this tremendous opposition to the idea of testing in general beyond screening the blood. Gay men's health crisis, which in the early days was the largest AIDS service organization, opposed all testing beyond blood screening until 1990. Okay, so there was this tremendous resistance to testing. And again, in our political system, we want people to lobby government in their self-interest. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And so the real issue is not, you know, why did activists oppose it? And it's understanding that and then saying, okay, how can I overcome those fears? Which is what I did. All right, I talked to people, I worked with them, I involved them in the process. And so in 1983, when CDC met with activists and blood banks, and the blood banks said, we don't want the cost of this, and activists said, we're afraid of discrimination, what CDC should have done was try to understand those fears and overcome them and say, okay, what are your fears? How can we work with you so that this doesn't become a problem? So we put laws in place, anti-discrimination laws in place to protect people's rights, okay? There's nothing wrong with, from the activist position, it's perfectly understandable, right? You know, there, there were a lot of hysteria in the country back in the 1980s. So, you know, the, the broader issue of civility, in, in my opinion, is that there, the themes of civility revolve around people, we're all people, power, uh, and policies. And sometimes you get the fourth P, which is profit. And it occurs all the time, right? So, you know, one of the, the, the Cold War, um, and not the one that ended in 1989, which I referred to, but what I refer to as the thermostat wars. I only refer to that in my family, not in speeches. <laughs> okay? And the thermostat wars are around that central question of, it's 72 degrees, are you hot or cold? Okay? And so you get married, and it's, you, you love and honor. But sometimes it goes a little farther year after year after year, in, in, it becomes trust but verify, right? And if you go to a hotel, there are many hotels where the thermostat is not real, where you turn it up or down and the hotel, it doesn't matter. It's like the, the elevator closed door button. It doesn't really do anything. And so civility is the concept of, hey, you know, let's work together and arrive at a, a temperature we can both feel comfortable with. In a, in a hotel, it's, hey, I'm paying for this. Don't put a fake thermostat in my room. You know, tell me the truth about what's really happening. So, you know, it's, it, you have a series on civility and everybody, you know, comes and gives their thoughts on different subjects, but it really is, what I hoped here is, you know, to take what happened with AIDS and apply it elsewhere you know, other issues we're facing, which is really reaching out, understanding what other people are talking about, and trying to come treat each other civilly and say, okay, if I was in your shoes, I'd feel the same way. I get it. 
So how can we, how can we get somewhere where, where we're all going to feel comfortable? Um, and that's what the government should have done, but didn't. And a lot of people died. Well, um. Yeah, I'm on a board of a company that's developed a, a not-for-profit pharmaceutical company uh, where we are developing a form of naloxone to sell over-the-counter at cost. And so in, in that instance, we have, um, uh, so have a fiduciary responsibility, even though it's a not-for-profit. Um, we, have, we have met with FDA and um, they're very positive about what we're doing. So, you know, this is a different situation where um, there's, there's, there's not a interest group opposing what we're doing. Now, having said that, are there potentially competitors who, are, who would try to oppose what we're doing? Sure. Um, that's a realistic thing that happens. Um, and, you know, we're aware of that. But in terms of... Uh, in terms of FDA, we're, we're, we're okay. How did that work? Uh, well, she had a different last name. Uh, she still does. Um, she, she, uh, she was in a different part of FDA than the part that was um, considering home HIV tests. Um, she she um, even... We, we weren't married for a portion of the time she was working there, but even so, she went to the Conflict of Interest Office uh, and told them about it. She sat on a commissioner level uh, task force on AIDS because she was policy person on AIDS drugs. Um, and uh, so uh, she would recuse herself if there was any discussion of home HIV testing. But yes, she did tell me that the commissioner referred to it as a Millinson problem, and that wasn't uncommon. Um, because it simply was something that FDA didn't want. Um, they put a ban in place and, um, uh, y you know, the, uh, uh, you know the, the other part of your question is, how did that work at home? That there, were <laughs> there were some times, I believe the, uh, you know, I've heard it about a thousand times, but it still goes in and out of my mind, something about being an unreal, perpetual unrealistic optimist, yeah. Um, I kept thinking that, you know, eventually they're going to come to their senses and um, they'll have to reverse this ban because, you know, it makes sense. But, um, you know, I'm a native Washingtonian and, uh, you know, politics is a tough business. It's a tough business. Um, and uh, uh, what makes sense and, and what happens in Washington, you know, aren't, aren't always the same. But uh, we're happily married. It worked out. <laughs> Well, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure you can get people to take it or buy it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, very much. Thank you guys.